Okay, let, let's get going. Um, let's start off with, uh, well, since you have the, the spotlight, uh, Dr. Davis, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to uh, just pose this one question and, and ask each of you to respond. I um, uh, want to know just a little bit about your background and the agency you're, uh, you work with, the population that you serve, um, where that is. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Jean Davis. I'm associate professor at Charles Drew University of Med Medical Medicine and Science. I was previously the medical director for AIDS Healthcare Foundation, and I have decades of uh, experience in HIV and also working with the community at large. Okay, uh, Darlene. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, almost afternoon. I'm Darlene Walker. I am the Director of Options for Recovery, which is a perinatal SUD treatment program originally for pregnant and parenting women on the campus of Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Uh, this is our 30th year um, and um, we provide extensive outpatient SUD treatment for women um, and we are in the South Bay. Okay, uh, Christian. How are you guys doing? Uh, Christian Diaz with Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles. I'm the program manager at the Center for Harm Reduction. I've been with the agency for five years. Uh, my background is also in social work. That's how I started. Um, we offer a lot of programs at the Center for Harm Reduction. It includes the uh, needle exchange, and we've been doing that since uh, 1998, I believe, but in, we're located in Skid Row. Uh, so down here, we've been doing this since 2005. Um, so we offer the MAP program, Medicaid Assisted Treatment. Um, we opened up a drop-in center. Uh, we immediately had to close it up because of COVID-19, but uh, we, it's still functioning. Uh, as soon as uh, we get the word to open it up again, it's, it's ready to roll. Um, we also have an outreach program that we go into the jails. Same thing, it had to stop because of COVID-19, but uh, we work with the homeless population, people with mental health issues, uh, disability. We, we try not to work with any minors. Uh, we do refer uh, the youth and minors to other agencies if they show up. Okay, thank you. Uh, Albert, speaking of youth and minors. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? My name is Albert Brady. I am the Director of Youth Service for Avalon Carver Community Center in South Central LA on 49th and Avalon. Um, and we work with uh, a lot of the youth and we have our Rights of Passage program that deals with the physical element where we're talking about um, harm reduction uh, and smoking cessation and uh, marijuana use as well for community prevention. Um, and we also have a methadone clinic that's uh, attached to our, our center. Um, and yeah, so I'm here to try to reduce that, uh, the rate for the, the kids and the teens. We do it a lot of teens and um, young people. Okay, thanks. Um, well, can you tell me if you're seeing any trends or any changes over the last year in the clients that are coming to you? I'm sorry, I missed you, Dr. Davis, or you went first. You went first. to the end of mine. Okay. Um, seeing any trends or changes over the last year in the clients that are coming to your services um, in terms of age, uh, what they're smoking and using? So, so yeah, I mean, the last two years, actually, um, one of the things that, that I've noticed, um, one, they're getting younger, right? Um, I think I had a, a young Latino girl who's, you know, 12, she was about to turn 12, 11 years old. Um, and it's funny because I actually smoked cigarettes at like nine, 10 years old, because uh, I thought it was cool. I would take my, my friend's grandmother's cigarettes and we would smoke them. But now um, the drug usage is a... It's, it's not really, tobacco is an issue because of the e-cig, right? A lot of them are using the vapes and the e-cigs, um, but they're also using more hardcore drugs uh, when it comes to like meth, crystal meth and things of that nature. And weed is just like a normal thing at this point. It's like chewing bubble gum, uh, marijuana usage. Okay, how, how about you, uh, Darlene, uh, the women that are coming in, any difference you're seeing? So we are not seeing as much as um, as much smoking um, cigarettes as much, and mainly because we are no smoking agency. But what we are seeing is uh, women come in, and instead of uh, cigarette smoking, they're now drinking a lot more. 
So I think mm -hmm. that the substitute for them is, you know, I can't I go in a store and buy a pack of cigarettes and, you know, smoke while I'm in treatment or anything like that. So now the drinking has picked up a lot more. So we just noticed that if there's not a lot of nicotine, there's definitely more and the caffeine as well. So excessive caffeine mm -hmm. use because there's no nicotine. And um, it was interesting because earlier I looked at the DSM and I go, Ugh. and there's caffeine in there, but there's no nicotine in there. And I'm thinking, and, and I want to talk a little bit more about the ASAM assessment that we all do mm -hmm. that does not include a real thorough screening for tobacco at all. Super. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, Christian, you seeing any changes? And we know that COVID has brought a whole new mm -hmm. Yeah, um, set of yeah. issues, but generally speaking, we'll, we'll attack that one after <laughs> yeah, so, this question. Mm -hmm. So same, same as Albert, we're, we're seeing them younger, getting younger. You know, they're, as soon as they're 18 years old, we're logging them in and we ask them for their uh, date of birth and they're like 18 years old, uh, 19 year olds, where five years ago when I started, it was a lot of the uh, 30 to 40 year olds that were doing heroin and, and meth. And now it's the, it, it's the young, the, the 19 year olds that jump they, they skip smoking. Sometimes they don't even smoke in high school or anything. They just skip it and they go straight into smoking heroin, you know, and then of course it leads them to start injecting it. Um, in the past two years, we've had an increase on fentanyl. Um, and this is where the, the vape pen comes in because yeah, we get, we get clients who, who smoke and, and, and also smoke cigarettes and then inject heroin or methamphetamine but they can't afford it. They, they can only afford one thing, which, and, and they stick with the harder drug, which, which is heroin or methamphetamine. Um, so, but, but with fentanyl, uh, there's a lot of clients that have come in and said, you know what, I have this, this pen that I want to put in fentanyl and maybe I could start smoking fentanyl or whatever. They, they try little yeah. gadgets here and there to, to, to smoke it, you know? Um, that's the little trend that we've, we've noticed, but definitely they're getting younger. That's, that's one thing. And Dr. Davis, what, what are we seeing in the population you're working with? Well, I don't treat anyone under the age of 18. So mm -hmm. um, anyone younger than that, I don't have any information on. But uh, what I found an increase in are, is a number of older people who are smoking meth. And I, yeah, I, was, I was just very, very surprised mm -hmm. to talk to women that were in their 50s and 60s who smoke meth. Um, but when it comes down to cigarette smoking, a large number of the HIV population understand that when you smoke, you enhance the progression of cardiovascular and pulmonary disease. So they kind of got that, that message. So, you know, it's, it's about 72% uh, of people who are HIV positive actually have tried to stop. And 63% uh, are currently thinking about quitting or being placed on a nicotine replacement therapy. Um, but uh, cigarette smoking is still very prevalent in the, in the HIV population, even with all the information and knowing that you can have problems orally with oral candidiasis or periodontal disease, hairy leukoplasia, a number of things, but they still smoke. But they do come in and try to stop smoking. Yeah, great. Um, so um, what's the role of, of the physician or the medical providers with your treatment programs? I know the, the ones that actually provide treatment, you have to have a, a medical director. Um, do they get involved with prescribing smoking cessation uh, aids or are they very involved at all other than just to sign off on the treatment plans and you know what it is they really, really have to do? So at my agency, you know our executive director, she's an advocate. Oh yeah. For everything um we um we don't prescribe but we do have um nicotine replacement supplies so whenever there's a client and we do the initial asam assessment and there's a nicotine concern we automatically i'm actually the person the smoking cessation person and so i automatically begin a process with making sure consents are received they talk to their their medical provider about it. Most recently, the client that we had that wanted to quit smoking was on Chantix. So it was interesting that um, Dr. Friedman, I believe, talked about that or, or the other doctor. Uh -huh. um, and so um, she's in our RSS services at this point. So we're hoping that she'll begin her process, but her doctor actually prescribed it for her. But we do a whole thing where we offer patches. 
Um, we have the lozenges. The women don't like the lozenges, but the gum and the patches have been very, very successful. So, um, and having information and education about, you know, the different replacement items that they can use and how often, because usually when they're admitted in the treatment, they're coming in smoking, even though we're non-smoking. So yeah. we immediately begin supporting them with that because that's very, very difficult. Okay. Um, anyone else want to talk about the medical providers, uh, uh, what you do regarding smoking when your patients or clients present? So uh, I, I go I'm on. Sorry. No, go. Oh, go thank Chris. you. Uh, okay. So with us, it's it's uh, we do have um, our case managers with the MAP program and a lot of the stuff. It's opiates first. You know, they they do bring up. Um, they they want to stop smoking. Um, we have a sense as well, case manager who they'll, if you want to stop any addiction, we'll, we'll refer you somewhere. There's, there's always a place we can refer you to. Um, we don't get that many, um, people coming in for, uh, trying to, trying to quit smoking. Um, we also get a lot of, uh, donations for, uh, nicotine gum, uh, and our doctor does pass it out whenever there's a client, but our clients, um, they do mention that they'll, they they want to stay up at night and sometimes smoking helps them for security purposes. You know, they're living out in the streets. If, if they're inject, injecting opiates, um, they'll, they'll knock out and somebody will take their stuff or they'll get robbed or something. Um, so they, they do need the, the nicotine. They do need um, uh, the smoking with uh, tobacco so, uh, and the cigarettes. But we do have the referrals for them. Uh, we don't get that many that, that do want to, stop smoking again because they usually do it on themselves they go cold turkey because they could only afford one thing it's either uh heroin or cigarettes which one you know which one's harder the addiction so of course they'll choose they'll choose the money for for heroin so. mm -hmm. but the, the resources we have them. okay great dr davis yeah. um yeah the uh patients who are yeah, aging yeah. positive obviously have a um more access to medical care. They, they're seeing providers more often than their regular patients. So they, they have the opportunity to talk more about smoking sensation or any kind of um, drug addiction. And um, we're finding also that the ones that want to stop, you're talking about the gay and lesbian focus group, they would like, prefer to have a focus group with folks who are HIV positive than people who are not HIV positive. So I, that's something that uh, the medical provider allowed us to do. Uh, the medical director, at least me, allowed us to do, and I write my, I write, I write prescriptions. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Albert, you you have any um, well, no, relationship with gonna, you? Mm -hmm. I was just going to piggyback what what Christian was saying. Oftentimes, when they come in, we uh, do refer them out uh, if we can't do it inside. But I did want to say that we did find influx to a veterans who uh, will want to stop um, the cigarette usage and drug usage, and oftentimes they related to PTSD. And also, um, they picked up the habit uh, while they were in the military. Yeah. I'm also a veteran, so it is very much the culture where everybody's like chewing mm -hmm. dip or you know smoking cigarettes and things of that nature. And a lot of them go cold turkey because they feel like they're strong enough and disciplined enough to just try to you know cold turkey it out. Um, so that's all I'm on today. Okay, great. And in reference to veterans, it's so interesting that um, if you're a veteran, you can buy tobacco at 18 and start smoking. Yep. But if you're not, if you're not, if you're not in the service, you can't smoke at age 18. Yeah, so folks that actually it. go to the military, they have the opportunity to start smoking earlier yeah. than people who are not in the military. And that is a terrible thing. I remember um, when I was in, before I went to, to war, they're like, well, when you go to war, you're going to smoke because it's so stressful. And I'm like, dude, I'm from South Central. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what stress is. <laughs> I was shot at 17. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to stop smoking, you know, but it's a coping, you know, you guys all, it's a coping mechanism, right? Yeah. The, the high stress, the anxiety, and then they become dependent on it. Um, yeah. And I deal with it now with guys that I serve with. Um, of course, they go straight to uh, self, self care, right? Yeah. So, self medicating. Uh, self medication, yeah. excuse me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Self medicating themselves. Oh, okay. Right. Great. Um, uh, a key question in terms of how much of this uh, smoking cessation activity you can do um, in the the realm you work in, are smoking cessation services billable? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
there. Uh, let's go, go to yes. healthcare first. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. For Dr. Davis with the Health Agency, uh, Christian, yeah. if you yeah, do. So okay. the, the the services are available. Is just like like I mentioned, um, not a lot of them seek it because uh, they do need the nicotine, the the drive to stay up at night. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but we have them, but it's, it's rare when somebody comes in and says, you know, um, I want to stop smoking. Uh, do you have anything that could help me with that? And we, we have the resources and, and the referrals to do it. Um, of course, now you're talking about medical insurance and, and all that stuff that has to come in. We get a lot of undocumented people down here. So for somebody again, who just wants to stop smoking, we have the resources, but not a lot of them, uh, want to, want to quit. They, they, they need to stay up. They need to, for security purposes, yeah. they, they, they use it at night. Yeah. Okay, so so your age is, you're a health agency, so you have the ability to bill for those services. Uh, Darlene, uh, tell us yeah, about. Yeah. Okay, tell us about uh, substance use disorders. You have a diagnosis. Um, you can't necessarily prove medical necessity. So um, as far as being actually billable, like I am treating this person for, you know, tobacco use disorder, that's my um, mm -hmm. diagnosis. No, um, then the answer is no, not directly for tobacco. Um, however, you can be very creative because mm -hmm. most of the time tobacco is linked to something else. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I really, really believe that it should be listed in the DSM. So it's not a billable service, but we've had to be really creative because like I said, usually it's linked to heroin. It's linked to something else usually, but it doesn't list itself as the primary um, addiction, which mm -hmm. for some patients and clients it is. Okay, and you were going to mention something about the ASAM. Can you tell yeah, folks what that is and how that affects your ASAM service? ASAM is the assessment tool uh, that most of us in LA County use. Um, American uh, Science of Addiction Medicine, that's what, that's what it stands for, the ASAM, the acronym. And it's the tool that we use to screen all of our clients to prove that they have a, a SUD diagnosis and also to provide what level of care and treatment, whether it's outpatient, inpatient, uh, detox, um, medication, medication assisted treatment or whatever. So that's a tool that we all use, but it does ask very, very few questions about tobacco. But again, if you meet someone and they come in and they say, you know, really I've smoked marijuana twice but I smoke cigarettes every day, a whole pack a day. It's really, really unfortunate because that real, there's telling you what their addiction is and mm -hmm. what their struggles are, but there's really no way to, you know, say we can help you solely for that. And there is something, and you know, every physician that we refer you to will help you from that point. So that's something that um, I saw in the chat, someone wrote, thanks for bringing that up. And mm -hmm. it is really something I think that we really need to push for in LA County. And it may be a policy issue, um, but the ASAM, ASAM is kind of general, but we do need to make sure that it ends up in the DSM because the caffeine and tobacco, huge, huge in the uh, substance use disorder population. I mean, it's, they go like really, really hand in hand and they're really, really bad too, you know. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, can, can you talk about some of the other current smoking cessation challenges facing community, tre community treatment providers or community um, organizations that are working with, with youth or adults or, or the, the older population? I can, I can go really briefly and then I'll pass it off. Um, I think people forget. I think when, uh, like for instance, and I always talk about this because every year there's something big. So the last couple of years, it's all been about opioid use. So the focus for everybody is like opioids, opioids. I'm like, hey, tobacco, we've got way more issues. So what I think the challenge is, is I think we go through periods of um, silos where we focus on certain drugs instead of really looking at tobacco and its effect on our community. Because it is, in my opinion, they say marijuana is a gateway drug or a gateway addiction. I really believe tobacco is. I, I just do. I'm like, marijuana's, you know, yes, and no, but tobacco and alcohol are just as huge. So I think we need to be more robust in not isolating what the big thing is right now. You know, because when I first started in the field, it was heroin. Then it was, uh, well, it was crack, and then it was heroin. And then now crack, and I heard Dr. Davis say this earlier, that a lot of people are using meth now. 
So we get clients that are 55, 60, mm -hmm. and they're using meth because it's yeah. cheaper. Yeah. So um, we need to focus on everything and we need to always kind of start with tobacco, tobacco and alcohol. We need to start there because that's, that's at the liquor store, y'all. <laughs> Sorry. And the thing about that is that tobacco and alcohol are legal. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's easier to get it. You don't have to worry about quote unquote going to jail unless you get a DUI. So they, it, it, they, they don't think there's anything wrong with it, you know, because if it was something was wrong with it, if it was really a drug, then it would be illegal. You know, so it just like, it would be like you know, meth, it's illegal. But because the government has said that drinking and smoking is legal, we have more problems with it, many more problems. And I think that uh, in reference to not being able to bill for it, uh, with all of the diseases that smoking causes, why we can't catch it before it leads to, you know, cancer and, and bronchitis and pneumonia and so on and so forth. It doesn't make sense. I mean, that's preventive medicine. You stop a person from, from smoking, you decrease the probability of them having cardiovascular and pulmonary disease. So why that's not billable for everyone, it, it's, it's not acceptable. It really isn't. Because I think once again, it is the way to ensure that uh, there continues to be a health disparity. Hmm. And if there's a health disparity, um, COVID-19 showed right then and there that we are gonna go first. And, and, and one of the things that we can do is decrease uh, alcohol and also decrease smoking. And we'll find that all, most of the chronic diseases will decrease also. So, but I, I think that's something that we really need to work on and make sure tobacco is billable and, um, and we can work harder with the community to make sure that it's not, it's not available. Because even though the law says 18, we know, they walk into liquor stores and get it at 14, 15 years old because people don't care. It's all about the dollar. They really don't care about the health. As long as they're getting rich, they don't care about how they're impacting the lives of our communities. You're, you're oh, muted. You're mute. Norma, you're mute. mute. You're muted. Magic. Oh, I'm God. talking on mute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and later today, we're going to have a young man talk about the Tobacco 21 laws. Uh, and we're going to have someone talking about vaping as well. Um, but I, I think we're, we're, we've still got a few more minutes and I want to leave time. We got a couple of questions in the, in the uh, QA box. Um, I wanted to ask, has your organization ever partnered with an academic or research-oriented entity to conduct smoking cessation research? If so, can you talk about it? Yeah, we have it. Not that I know of. Or okay. Not that I know of. All right. All right. Well, that, that, that may be an opportunity if, if you're interested. And a lot of times, in, especially now, community-based organizations are, are really struggling uh, financially. Uh, they always have, but I mean, even now with COVID and not being able to really get your billing in because of the, the type of billing you may have, maybe somebody needs to be in the seat or somebody needs to be on the phone and you can't get that, but you still got to pay the staff. So people are, are, are having difficult times. You might reach out to some of your uh, universities or, or other uh, medical institutions to see if they have opportunities uh, for partnering, uh, where you may have something that you want to research and they may have a researcher that is interested and you'll be able to connect and, and get some money out of that grant. Um, just, just something that I've learned over the years, how to stretch your dollars. Um, all right, let's go to some of the questions that are there. Um, Often when I speak with teens regarding their marijuana use, they say they do not smoke cigarettes, stating they are cancer sticks, but see no issues with marijuana because they say it is natural, not considering tobacco is also a natural plant leaf. How do I see some, however, I do see some increase in vaping. Okay, it's, it's a statement. Yeah, that's so true. And yeah. someone commented on what you said, Albert, like, like uh, during World War II, tobacco companies were given cigarettes for free. Yeah, and you they see actually it. inside of the MREs in our food, our food packaging, they would be in the MREs. Yeah, and you see in the movies that the sergeant, the drill sergeant, would be out there when they finished drilling. He said, "All right, Eddie, smoke them if you got them." Yeah. So. <laughs> smoke breaks. Um, <laughs> way to. Have you surveyed teens regarding tobacco versus marijuana use? It's not been my experience that tobacco use is higher than marijuana use in the population, population that I work with. 
However, I'm just going by the teams I work with in a hospital setting. Um, so it's funny because um, a lot of them don't see hookah or vaping as yeah, actually yeah. tobacco yeah. because of the flavor. They're like, oh, this is Fruity Loops and this is Honey Nut Cheerios. They don't really understand it. So what I was going to say earlier was also about being a holistic approach with the kids because they're not honest, right? Because your parents are there and they don't want their parents to know that they're using drugs or even tobacco as a whole. Um, so oftentimes we find that our, we have a, a holistic uh, program that we run them through and that's when we kind of get the truth out of them with our rights of passage program. But we do find that a lot of them do feel like tobacco is uh, but then they would do hookah, mm -hmm. right? Or they would do the e-cig or the vaping. So yeah. I don't really think the knowledge base is there oftentimes that they even know what they're doing. Well, and we know that's the truth because you don't yeah. know until you're 28 is what I tell people. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. And, and I don't, Dr. Friedman, are you aware of any studies? Uh, I don't think we've done a, anything around teens or if there's been much um we haven't um i did want to comment um uh, that i did get funded from the department of defense to look at a grant on e-cigarettes in the heart and i made a case that um the military personnel soldiers use are now using a huge amount of vapes and less cigarettes wow and yeah. that's why that was one of the reasons why the dod decided to fund me is you know even when i'm doing my experiments in um in rodents, it is a big problem in the military is vaping. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll at least address it's some of the mechanisms of that. More clean to just put the vape pen up. Than right, it's the... easier to uh, hide it and more discreet and yeah. So um, it's a big problem now. Okay, well, that's our questions. And we have two minutes. Does anyone want to wrap up? Got any parting words for us? No, I do want to share with everybody and especially with uh, Christian and Albert, um, there is a youth policy group um, that I have information to. We meet you know, quarterly or so, and it really focuses on everything that has to do with youth. Um, and it's uh, we're working on a lot of policy changes and things that we have to implement, like even the ASAM and how you assess youth and what's youth. We're, we're trying to focus on a youth um, focus uh, service of care for SUD because as you guys know SUDs are set the substance use disorder is set up primarily for adults and we've been advocating for youth system of care so I'd love for you guys to reach out and get my information and join us because um, that's a place where we can all share and where we can continue to advocate for our youth. Absolutely I'm down. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I encourage people to stay toward the, to the afternoon sessions. I ho hope no one's going to leave at lunch break, but my, our two students, Sam Kim, who's going to be talking about the Tobacco 21 law, really emphasize how important it is to not have people start smoking when they're young. I think this Tobacco 21 law is going to, and it's a national law now after it's being fairly successful in California, a national law that's gonna for, that forbids people from buying cigarettes till they're 21 is going to have a big impact. And then um, um, Jason Martinez is going to be talking about e-cigarettes. So both of them are really related to what our panel talked about. I think our panel was great today. And I really enjoyed uh, meeting all you guys. And I know, uh, I know Dr. Davis quite well. Good to see you, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Okay, thank, thank you. I appreciate you all taking time away from your, your busy days. I'm sure you got more Zoom calls to do and more uh, online patient uh <laughs> patient medicine, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and so we're, we're going to break for lunch for half an hour and there'll be a little entertainment at lunch so you can keep your computer on if you want to and, and listen to the music or the little mm -hmm. uh, videos that I might pop on um, but we'll see you back at 1230 is that right